white noise, pink noise, brown noise, and all the others all have this big thing in common. They used to confuse the crap out of me. But I actually understand them now and I'm really excited about that and I wanna share what I've learned with you which is gonna involve talking about things like frequencies, superposition, decibels, finding a picture of a goat, and the surprising fact that the name brown noise has nothing to do with the color brown. It actually kinda has more to do with pollen, which I didn't see coming at all. I want to start with white noise because it's the most basic really and I think that if you can bake the white bread you can bake all the other kinds of bread. <laughs> a pretty standard definition of white noise is a sound signal that contains all frequencies at equal intensity. The name white noise just comes from a comparison to how white light works where you mix together all colors or frequencies of light waves. And for me it's really the all frequencies part of that that was giving me the most trouble because like imagine looking at a speaker and saying play every frequency. <laughs> all of them? Thankfully, that part of the definition actually isn't quite right, and I've gone ahead and written what I consider to be a better version of the definition, where instead of saying all frequencies, it says so gosh darn many frequencies that if more got added into the mix, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But rewriting the definition that way didn't help me at all to understand how one speaker can play multiple frequencies. This has actually bothered me for a long time, thinking about like music and stuff. The speaker doesn't have to play multiple independent sound signals for us to hear multiple independent sounds. How can one speaker even play a few frequencies? A speaker has a diaphragm. The diaphragm vibrates and the vibration is what we perceive as sound. If the diaphragm is vibrating, that means that at any given moment, it is either not moving or it is being pushed outward or it's being pulled inward. Think about how weird it is that that can play music music and that you can understand the different instruments and stuff. It can't be doing multiple things at the same time and the real magic is that it doesn't have to. The fact that we can listen to a song with a single sound signal and pull out different instruments and different sounds and stuff is more a miracle of biology than it is of technology. It can play a combination of all of them and our brains can work backwards to extract out the originals. This is a concept called superposition and it's easiest to understand using pure tones like this. What you're hearing is a 131 hertz frequency, which means that the diaphragm inside your speaker is vibrating back and forth 131 times every second to produce the sound. The squiggle that you see on your screen is a visual representation of that vibration, and you'll notice that it's very smooth, predictable, repetitive, always going up and down by the same amounts. But watch what happens when I add a second tone into the mix. You'll notice now that there are three squiggles on the screen and I want you to completely ignore the yellow one. Don't look at it, don't you even think about it. Just focus on the blue and pink ones. The blue one is that original 131 hertz tone and the pink one is a 1047 hertz tone. And you can hear them both at the same time, but the speaker doesn't actually have to play both independently, which is where the yellow squiggle comes in. That is how the speaker actually vibrates to play both tones together and you can see how it's a combination of the two. The way this works is that at every point along those waveforms, if you look at how far in or out each wave would tell the diaphragm to move on its own, you can total that up to get a new position for the diaphragm and then just keep running that calculation along the whole thing. Looking at the shape of the yellow squiggle, you can see how it follows the long, slow ups and downs of the deeper tone, but built into that, it also has the much smaller, quicker ups and downs of the higher tone. Your ears and brain can team up and work backwards from that yellow squiggle and determine that the pink and blue ones must be there, and that's how you can hear both. And of course, the more waves that you add into the same room together, the freakier the party gets. Noise is just what happens when you take superposition too far. Too many frequencies at the same time can make for a very sloppy signal that is hard for brains to deal with. So I made this thing to help me visualize playing multiple frequencies at the same time because it's a bunch of different pendulums and the thing about a pendulum is it's great for showing this recurring back and forth oscillating motion and this one at this end has a really high frequency. It's going back and forth really quickly but if you go all the way down here to the longer stuff and do this one, you'll notice that it takes a lot longer to go back and forth. And so then the idea is that if we were to play all of these at the same time, even though they start out with this really regular pattern and it, it, it's kind of predictable, very quickly descends into total chaos. Some of them are going a little bit to the left, some of them are going a little bit to the right, a lot to the left, a lot to the right. This one's not moving. At 
each moment in time, the total of all of the motion is gonna be this completely chaotic thing. And the thing is, if you were to look at any individual one of them going back and forth, you would find that it's moving very predictably at a set pace. Just like the individual tones from earlier, each one is smooth and predictable all on its own, but add enough together and it quickly becomes chaotic. And that's what noise is. I love this shot so much because this was just a test shot to see how things would line up on camera. And the whole visual works a lot better than I expected it to. And then the second reason I love it is look at how hyped up I am about that. I couldn't believe it. So that helped me to understand how a speaker could physically play noise from it, but it still didn't help me to understand how the different types of noise are different from one another. And what really helped that click for me was thinking it through, of course, with a ridiculous example. Imagine yourself in a big empty room. This room that I'm in is not big or empty. Just pretend, okay? And then into that room, you bring a speaker, okay? And then from that speaker, you start playing a frequency, all right? now. You also have a microphone. So you're in this room playing a frequency, recording it in a microphone. Now that microphone is going to pick up that waveform of that tone like we saw earlier. But now let's make it absurd. You don't just have one speaker in the room. Let's say that you have almost 20,000 speakers in the room and all of them are playing slightly different tones spaced out across the entire range of human hearing. The lower end of the human hearing range is 20 hertz and the upper range of human hearing is around 20,000 hertz. So let's say that you've got a speaker that's playing a 20 hertz frequency. You've got another one playing a 21 hertz frequency, another one playing a 22 hertz frequency and so on and so forth, all the way up to 20,000. What is that microphone going to record? What's it going to sound like? That's gonna sound like white noise, maybe. In this example, the recorded sound would only be white noise if every speaker was set to the same volume, which comes full circle back to the equal intensity part of the definition from earlier. And that's really the part of the definition that we can start tweaking and playing with to get every other type of noise. Think about just turning those different tones up or down by certain amounts to emphasize different frequency ranges. For pink noise, we want to emphasize lower frequencies. So that means going around and turning down the speakers more, the higher the frequency it's playing. And that's why if you compare the sound of white noise to the sound of pink noise, you'll notice that the pink noise does sound deeper, even though you still can't discern any individual tones out of it. Now to get specific about how much to turn down each speaker as you go, we're going to need to talk about octaves. Yeah, like that. An octave is any doubling of frequency. And so going from 40 hertz to 80 hertz is an octave. The next octave would be from 80 hertz to 160 hertz and then 160 to 320 and so on and so forth. Pink noise promises to love each of its octaves equally, whereas white noise makes the bolder claim that it loves every frequency equally, which I don't really, I don't know, it seems like a lot. To get more technical about it, in pink noise, you have the same amount of sound power in each octave. And to accomplish this, since each octave is twice as wide, we'll say, as the one before it, that means that you take the intensity in each octave and cut it in half as you go for the same total amount of sound being represented in each of those octaves. And that is basically going to inform you on how to set the volume on each of those speakers in that 20,000 speakers in a room example. And now speaking of volume, you've probably heard volume referred to in terms of decibels before, and decibels are weird, man. They operate on what's called a logarithmic scale, and the way that it works is if you take a sound at a certain decibel level, and then you increase its volume by 10 decibels, you've actually ended up with a sound that's 10 times more intense than the one that you started with. Go up another 10 decibels and now your sound is a hundred times more intense than the one that you started with. The math around all of that is honestly a little bit weird, but if you think about doubling the intensity or cutting the intensity in half, what you're really talking about is going up or down roughly three decibels. So keeping that in mind, a good working definition of pink noise is a sound signal containing many frequencies that experiences a three decibel drop per octave. And it's called pink noise just because it is emphasizing the lower frequency, higher wavelength waves, just like how pink light would be made up by emphasizing the red end of the spectrum, but containing a healthy amount of everything else. And that definition actually makes it really easy to understand what brown noise is, but it doesn't make it easy to understand where the name brown noise comes from. To get to the definition of brown noise from here, we just swap the three for a six and call it a day, which means that brown noise experiences that drop in intensity as you go up the octaves, but it's happening twice as fast, which is why we're left 
was a deeper, bassier, more rumbly kind of sound. But the name brown noise, haha, <laughs> that's more of an adventure. It's not named after the color brown, it's actually named after something called Brownian motion, which is a type of random walk behavior that was first described by a botanist named Robert Brown when he was studying how pollen particles move. Now, it's a little bit confusing, admittedly, to try and relate this back to sound specifically, but to keep it simple, what you can think about is taking a speaker diaphragm and telling it to move according to the description of Brownian motion, what you would end up with is a sound signal that has a frequency distribution that experiences a roughly six decibel drop per octave, which, of course, now we call brown noise. If you feel sad for brown noise because it's not really truly named after a color, you can call it red noise. It's totally fine. It's, it's a, that's actually another name for it. Some of the other noise colors that exist are blue noise which is basically just the opposite of pink noise. You have a three decibel increase per octave. You've also got violet noise or purple noise, which is the opposite of brown noise, which is a six decibel increase per octave. And then you have green noise, which is just terrible. <clears throat> nice. <laughs> Now, as for how these noise signals are actually generated, no, no one is filling a room with 20,000 speakers playing different tones and recording the sound on a single microphone. I'm sure they use at least two microphones. Also, there's no need to go ahead and build an audio file with 20,000 different waveforms in it that you compile into one end result. You don't need to do all of that because the thing is, these noise signals, whether it's white, pink, brown, green, blue, purple, anything like that, it's supposed to be random. And so you can just start with a random number generator. That random number generator can generate random numbers. <laughs> That's what they do. Then you use that sequence of random numbers to build a completely chaotic waveform. And then from there, it's really just a matter of filtering that chaos to constrain it into the definitions that we've covered in this video. There are other methods, but that's probably the go-to, I think. That's the part that I researched the least. Anyway, that is all that I have for this video. Hope you enjoyed. Thank you so very much for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.